Now, have you ever had a, one of those issues where you think sometimes perhaps God has got it wrong on this one? Um, now, of course, we know that God's totally incapable of being wrong or making a mistake, but, and we know that and we agree with that, but there's sometimes just that nagging worldly, let's admit it, worldly thought in our minds that just maybe this time we, his finite and fallen creations, can see more clearly than him on some point. And I have to confess, while I know it's wrong, I'm tempted to think those thoughts at times about why the Bible teaches that the majority of people won't be saved. So they'll end up in eternal judgment in hell and the lake of fire. I've struggled, as I know some of you have, uh, with the idea that so few human beings in the end will be saved, apparently. That's what we understand the Bible is saying. It seems such a big price to pay for the eternal happiness of a few, and of course God himself. It's his, it's his pleasure. It just seems not very efficient. That's, maybe that's my engineering mind thinking there, I don't know. But Now in no way do I want this to sound like I doubt God's, good, God's goodness or the wisdom of his plan, but it's just something that for us from our earthly perspective we can't really have a good explanation for, I don't think. I think some nodding heads good. But it does serve as a reminder that if, if we could understand everything about everything, then who would need God? You know, we'd be God. We wouldn't need God. So we need to trust Him with that. And what we uh, can make sure, at least, that for our part, that we've personally responded in faith to His call, and that's kind of the, the large push of today's message, because that's what we do have responsibility for: is our response. Whatever the situation is for everyone else, it's that personal responsibility, that gift of free will, that's the key element in this. Because that's what we see Jesus addressing here in that passage. You know, there's all these people around him, they've got, each has got their own free will. What are they going to say to his, to his challenge? Because he, he basically asks us all, so are you in? Are you coming with me? He's walking around, that's what he's pretty much saying to everyone. Who's coming with me? So if you answer that with a yes, which I hope each person here today has done or will, is doing. So if you do answer that with a yes, what does that mean for you? So what difference does it make in your everyday life and your priorities and therefore your decisions? Because everything you believe will sooner or later, will, it will come out in your actions. So what are we to believe so that's the challenge we're going to encounter today as Jesus continues his journey toward Jerusalem so there's a map there I'll talk about that in a second but just uh, even in this passage we see hints that this journey toward the cross is constantly on his mind you know, it's getting closer now but it's the linchpin of what Jesus came to do but he's taking a slight diversion today geographically speaking anyway so the best information I find says that Jesus has just gone across the Jordan River to a region called Perea. And I've just circled it there for you. And if I'll just point out a couple of things. So, so Galilee up there is where Jesus did most of his ministry in the early parts. And he was, Capernaum's just here on the shore there of Galilee. And the furthest in the journeys of things that we've seen in Luke so far has been up as far as Mount Hermon, which is up right at the top here. And then he made his way back and now he's sort of working his way down towards Jerusalem which will put a target there so that makes, that's his target. A bit small, I didn't want to make it too big, it would look funny. But yeah, so he's working his way down he's now just crossed over into Perea here. So that's the general understanding of where he is at this point. So and that's where he's going to be for all this whole section from now on through to 17 verse 10. Um, that's a fair chunk of the, of the next part of Luke there. And time-wise, it's only a matter of months or weeks, perhaps, until the crucifixion. So you see things are becoming more focused. So we really, we can feel as we're going through this in Luke, he's really ch hitting people harder and harder. So that's that question. Are you in? It's more urgent than ever before. So that's where we pick it up, Luke 13, 22. So if you have your Bibles, please be there. Otherwise, follow on the screen. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? Now, this would have been a common question floating around in the day. 
because the Jews mistakenly believed they were the only ones who would get to be saved. And even then, not all of them, you know, guys like tax collectors and prostitutes and all those, they wouldn't be allowed, certainly they wouldn't make it. And uh, so their mentality was that even within Judaism, not all the Jews would make it to heaven. As well as, of course, the Gentiles, they just had no hope at all. Um, they might accept those who you know, proselytize, but we'll see. Um, we'll see. Uh, no, we won't see. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what they thought about that. But, um, but basically, there's a whole bunch of people who wouldn't be there in glory. So that question was now raised with Jesus by someone. There's someone there. So we're not told who asked it. It is always important to see who asked the question, but we're told it's just a general anyone. But it's a universal question, so it's just someone. So that's how does Jesus answer? So the second part of verse 23. And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Now, this is interesting that he answers like this. Firstly, he doesn't correct the idea that only a few will be saved. In fact, as he often does, he takes this sort of theological point which is really behind it and he makes it about us personally. He did that early in the chapter, right? If you think back, he, when the Galileans, sorry, when the people asked him about the Galileans that Pilate had killed or, and the people who had the Tower of Siloam fall on them, um, they asked, were they worse sinners? So that was kind of a theological question. But Jesus didn't get caught up with trying to theologize with them. He, what did he say? Do you remember his response when they asked those two questions? He had the same answer twice. He said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So he made it personal and a challenge for his people who asked the question. So that's why probably less and less people asked him questions after a while. It made him feel uncomfortable. But this is what he does again. He makes a challenge to stri- for them to strive to enter through the narrow door. So yes, he affirms the presupposition behind their question, which is the idea that only a few will be saved. But mostly this, that this means something in your life. If you ask that question, it means something. And that's the main point. So you know, we can theologize back and forth all day and, and there's a place for doing that. But what really matters in the end is yours and my response to the challenge and call of Jesus. Right? Yeah, that's what matters. How do, how do you respond to it? You can theologize all you like. And he says we need to strive. And does that sound right? Do we, don't we just sort of rest in the work of Christ? It's kind of what we just celebrated at communion. Yes, of course, we do rest in his work. His work is sufficient. But we must also not be lazy with the completed work he's given, uh, sorry, the, with what that completed work has given to us. So what he's basically saying is we need to get serious about following him. So you're a child of God, that's wonderful, that's taken care of you, you'll be in heaven, but and now you believe you have the eternal life of the Spirit of God. That's not in doubt for those of us who are in Christ and spiritually regenerated. It's what we call justification. I keep using that big word, but I'll keep explaining it. It's just that's the first when you become saved. It's done and dusted. But what's in view for us then is sanctification. That's the process of spiritual growth by the Spirit of God in us. So now I'll leave that challenge challenge uh, for each of us there because that's for believers. Okay. And I don't want to get off track because I'll soon show you how Jesus here is talking to unbelievers. So we want to keep it on topic. But we do need to always have a challenge for ourselves as well, I think. So to them, these people in Perea, he's saying they need to get serious about their Jewish religion. That is the law. Um, Actually, more specifically, he's got to get uh, serious about what their Jewish religion is trying to show them. Because they're very serious about their religion, but they're actually missing the point. Because the law is trying to show them their need for a saviour and the New Testament tells us that. That's what the law does. It's its, it's purpose. Because they thought they were being serious by following all the rules in the law. But the reality was, like I said, they're missing the point of the law. The law is not about that. Now obviously they're supposed to try and follow it 
you know, but realize that they can't follow it fully. So they were supposed to be getting serious about seeking God in his mercy and grace since they were more aware of their sin and wretchedness through their failure to truly obey the law, if they were honest. So, uh, but so a few Jews saw, a few Jews saw that point, and that's why Jesus called it the narrow door. He's the narrow door because they they missed that point. They keep trying to follow the law, and it's taken them through the wide door. And it's because of this misunderstanding of the purpose of the law that many were seeking to enter by obeying the law itself. But of course, we're not able. They thought they were able. They thought they had them all checked off, but they couldn't. So it's good to strive, but they were striving for the wrong thing. It's that word striving too that's interesting. It's the Greek word, if you've got your sheet there in front of you, agonizomai. I guess I'm saying that close enough to write, agonizomai. But what does that sound like to you? Agonize. Yeah. Agony. And that's where we get our word agony, yes, and agonize. Yeah, and uh, it implies a deep and heartfelt struggle to get somewhere or do something. It's the really... Um, if you, let's put it in Aussie fair dinkum <laughs> be fair dinkum Jesus doesn't want half hearted followers you need to agonise a bit more sort of you know, and you understand what I'm getting at there so, so let, let's look at Jeremiah 29.13 God says this you don't need to go there I'll just bring it up you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart so who's the, the subject of that sentence there's three me's there they're all God right so yes it's all about God you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart so seeking with all your heart is that striving that Jesus is talking about now I'd better clarify here do be careful that this doesn't become a works thing which is where the Jews were getting off track trying to earn your salvation because it's not the intensity of your striving that will move God to save you or me or anything it's not the ones that try harder get better in heaven. It's not how it works. Not the ones that try harder who get to heaven. Nothing we do can bridge the gap. Only Jesus' blood can do that and has done that. But by the same token, the kind of attitude that many have, like, you know, hey, God's forgiving, I'll be fine. I think that's kind of what he's talking about against here. The, the careless attitude that leaves you lost in the end. And the end may come sooner than any, any of us think. All these people who aren't very well. <laughs> it reminds us about death. And then, of course, as Jesus' return, it could happen at any time. So one day God will say, that's it, you've had your chance. And that's kind of the theme in this next little section, starting at verse 25. So if we're back in Luke 13. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us. Then he will answer you, I do not know where you've come from, or where you, where you come from. Okay, so this section has a lot of potential pitfalls because it's easily misunderstood. So I thought the best way to try and explain it is to use an illustration to help get a handle on it. Okay, so let's see how this illustration goes. Ho hopefully it helps us navigate not just this passage, but all the passages that talk about being cast out and weeping and gnashing of teeth and the outer darkness and all that. You, you may, you've read a few of those that sort of sprinkled around. And just because a passage uses one of those phrases doesn't always mean they're talking about exactly the same thing, just to, just so you're careful on that one. So as we get into this, please put your preconceptions aside about perhaps what that, all, that means and go with what the texts actually say, otherwise we get in a real muddle. So here's the illustration that will hopefully help us. So let's imagine... A big Christian family. He's got six kids in that picture, so I think it's fairly big. Depending on what kind of church you're involved in, I suppose. But yeah. Some are different. So let's make them an American family, because that works here, because we're talking about Thanksgiving and Christmas is part of the story. All right? Now, we all know about Christmas, but who knows when Thanksgiving happens? No, this week. It's the fourth Thursday in... In November, which is this coming Thursday. So, do you know what happens at both Thanksgiving and Christmas? What's some common themes between the two? Sorry? 
Turkey, well, yeah, lots of eating. <laughs> Turkey's more specifically probably for th- Thanksgiving, but you, you have turkey at Christmas too. So, yeah, and family get together, yep. And uh, certainly in the Northern Hemisphere, it's that, you know, that coming into that time of year, it's getting cold. And uh, that's good a place to be inside and eat and hang out with each other. So, yeah, so there's turkey and pumpkin pie as well. Don't forget pumpkin pie for Thanksgiving. Now, for this American family, there's, there's actually a Thanksgiving fete in, in town on the, the day of Thanksgiving, on the Thursday. And so they're all down there, with the, and the townsfolk are all there hanging out, enjoying time together. But during the fete, one of the children, and let's point out who it is, is this little guy here. He gets up to no good. So Dad catches him hanging out with some known dodgy characters, and they perhaps they look a bit like that. <laughs> Need to make it memorable. So there's some dodgy crew he's hanging out with. And it turns out he's been stealing money from people to go and buy donuts and stuff like that. And uh, being a general troublemaker down at the fate. Now, because of the son's foolish behaviour, it gives the, it's giving the family a bit of a bad name because you know he's a upstanding church, church family here and. And Dad's not happy about it. So when they get home, Dad says he disowns him as a son and kicks him out of the family forever. Is that how it goes? <laughs> no. I just thought I'd see your response to that. No. Um, no. A reasonable dad wouldn't generally do that kind of thing. You can't change the fact that his son is biologically his son. He is his son and that can't change. Uh, but what he can do is show some discipline, of course. So when they all get home, Dad calls his son aside and he says, Now, listen, son, uh, what you did was very wrong. You stole from other people and you hurt both you hurt them, of course, but you also hurt yourself. You ever heard Dad say that? You, know, you hurt me and you hurt them. He let us all down. Uh, he didn't quite say it like that, but you know, he's, he's hurt himself there and he actually brought a bit of you know, disgrace on the family because of what you did. Now, you are still my son and I love you but you need to take some time to think about what you've done and learn to behave the way we expect of you. So that means while we have Thanksgiving dinner tonight, you won't be allowed to join us. So you know, we'll, we'll give you some food, perhaps a sandwich or something, um, in your room so you don't go hungry, but you'll, you'll need to stay in your room um, and think about what you've done. Uh, so yes, I'm afraid you'll be missing out on the family celebrations of Thanksgiving this year. And now, how does the boy react to that, do you think? He's, uh, he's pretty devastated. He's really upset because he's been looking forward to this for ages. He even helped mum prepare the turkey earlier in the day and he was imagining how good it would taste and all that, but now he's just going to ham and cheese or something. Um, now that the reality is set in, he has lots of tears and remorse for his selfishness and stupid behaviour. But he understands that this is the consequence for his silly decisions and, and his bad witness before the town as well. And as he sadly turns to go, he thinks for a second and he turns to his dad and he says, what about Christmas? Because, you know, Thanksgiving's big, but Christmas is bigger. It's the biggest one. So dad replies, I'll make sure you learn your lesson from this, son, and everyone, even the extended family, will be there at Christmas. So you'll be there. In other words, you know, if if something else happens, you'll work out another way to, to work through it. So the, the son goes off to his room and shuts the door and that's where he is for Thanksgiving. But at the end of that conversation, there's a knock on the door, on uh, the front door of the house. And Dad goes to answer and he sees uh, that bunch of no-goods that his son was hanging out with earlier in that day. And they come and they, and they say, hey, can we have Thanksgiving with you guys? We hear you've got a really good spread. You know, we've been told all about it. Can we hang out? And Dad says, sorry, this is for our family only. Uh, You go to your own family and have your own Thanksgiving, sorry. And they say, but, you know, we've been hanging out with your son all day. You know, we're part of the family, aren't we? But he replies, no, you guys are a bad influence on my son. I don't want you around here. You'll have to leave. So he shuts them out, closes the door. And, you know, they, they go off and they swear and throw eggs at the house and stuff like that. But that's all they can do because they're locked out. Okay, so there's our illustration. In fact, we can call it a parable almost, if you like, because as you may have guessed, the characters represent real people. 
And so as we go through the rest of the passage, we'll use that to hopefully explain what I think Jesus is getting at here. Uh, not just here, but all those you know, weeping and gnashing of teeth places. So hopefully you can use that in a variety of places. Okay, so let's look at where we are. Uh, verse 25 in Luke 13. So this is where we were. So, so we have some people being locked out of the gathering in the kingdom of God. That's, that's the context of what Jesus is talking about. And the kind of gathering is a feast, which we can see from verse 28 when we get there. So these people are being excluded from the feast for some reason. So what reason does Jesus give there? Why are they... Doesn't, doesn't, yes. I do not know where you come from. Or in a similar passage, Matthew 7, 23, which is not the same situation, but has many of the same elements. Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. Okay, so uh, that's probably the King James Version, but yeah. Um, similar kind of idea. So it's this idea of not knowing who they are or where they come from, kind of not knowing them. That's the basis for the exclusion. Can you see that? that cool? Here at least, anyway, this, for this particular episode. So in our parable, there were two separate exclusions from the feast. All right, there was the son, and there was the bunch of rascals who turned up and wanted to come in. All right, there's two exclusions. So... Which one is closest to the one Jesus describes there? Yeah, the one's at the door. So you know, they both had a quite a strong emotional reaction to the exclusion. There's regret or anger. But they weren't for the same reason. So it was, it was the, the, the rascal gang, if you like, who are most like the ones Jesus said here. Because Dad said he didn't know where they're from, and, and that didn't really matter. The point was they're unknown to the family. They're not part of the family, right? So they weren't welcome at that particular moment. It's not saying they never you know, let visitors in the house. It's just this is a particularly family time. So in the same way, Jesus is saying that these people in his illustration are being shut out of the feast because of the lack of relationship and belonging to the family. But they have something to say about that. So don't get it down without a fight. Verse 26. And then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. So it's a bit like those young guys trying to argue their way in. But these people in Jesus' story, their, their reasoning is, you know, hey, we hung out with you and your family so that we're mates, aren't we? So we can just hang out with you. But he will say, verse 27, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. He says it again. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. So I hope you see the parallels there with uh, what the story I was telling you before. You know, that despite their protests and their, just their fundamentally unregenerate nature means they simply don't belong with the saved people. Now, we next thing we do is get to that interesting and sometimes misleading phrase, verse 28. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth is where these people get thrown out to. Where you, when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. So yes, that tricky phrase is weeping and gnashing of teeth. So straight away we all think of hell, right? Okay, that's what it's going to be like in hell. And on this occasion, I would agree that yes, he, this is talking about the reaction to hell, to being permanently denied entry into the kingdom of God. And remember, this is largely Jewish audience. Even though he's across the Jordan in Perea, there's still, um, you know, outside of Judah proper, there's still a lot of Jews there, a high proportion at least. So they just assumed they were in you know, because they were born Jewish. So I must be in because I'm a Jew and I haven't done anything really bad, so I'll be in. But what's the sole basis for being admitted into the kingdom of God any time, right through history? Sorry? Yeah, faith. Yeah, faith and repentance is part of that faith. It's that turning from lack of faith to faith. Yep. So it's not bloodline, and it's not good works, or anything else that these people thought it was. It was and always is by faith in God's promises. Now, Abraham was saved by faith, wasn't he? Okay. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And most specifically, certainly for us, now we know Jesus has come. It's in him, specifically his son. So here we have Jesus shocking his hearers by describing a situation where the patriarchs of Israel, so you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and the prophets, um, 
they're all dining together, but these Jews who thought they were good, obedient followers of the law are shut out. And that's not the worst of it, but we'll get to that in a minute. So yes, due to their lack of faith, they're in hell, ultimately the lake of fire. So they're like the bunch of miscreants we saw who tried to get into the family's Thanksgiving dinner. They weren't part of the family. But back to the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, now, I don't have time to look at all the other occurrences of the phrase and try back up all this fully, but uh, I want you to be aware that not every time it occurs does it mean the torment of hell or lake of fire. Okay, Not every time. Sometimes it refers to being in the kingdom but being shut out of the banquet. Like how our son in our illustration was in the family and still in the house, but he was barred from the celebration due to his bad behaviour. Now, I know that might jam some gears from some people, but uh, they might say, do you believe in Christian purgatory? So we're not all accepted. So no, I don't believe in purgatory. That's not defensible from Scripture. So neither you nor someone on your behalf can earn your way into the kingdom after your death. That's, that's not right. You can't do that. that. That's what purgatory is. So we are all, as Hebrews 9.27 says, destined to die once and after that face judgment. Okay, so that's, that's it. You've got one chance. And it's also against reincarnation too. There's no reincarnation. It's just <laughs> you die and that's it. There's no more chances to be with Jesus. But we do need to realize that this idea that when we die, we just go to heaven uh, for eternity and everyone's just the same floating around in clouds of bliss, that's also not biblical ever either. Now, we do go to heaven forever, yes. Well, yes, it, it, it is eternally be with the Lord. That's what it's about. But it's not this playing harps and floating on clouds. It's nothing like that. In fact, there's lots of stuff that needs to happen before the eternal state is set up. So, and that's such as what Kevin talked about last week, when you know, Jesus rules the earth during the millennium, the thousand years, in fulfilment of God's promise to David. And I regret I don't have time to talk about all that and show you why I believe that, but that's, uh, we'll deal with those things over time. But the point is, weeping and gnashing of teeth is simply a well-known idiom in that day, and it expresses a wide range of emotions, such as, I'll put them up on the board, the deep sorrow and pain and anger even, and regret. So it can be any of those things or all of them at one time. So it depends on the situation. So it can be used to describe the response of those who miss the kingdom of God altogether, like these people that Jesus is describing in verse 28, or it can describe the reaction to those who miss out on the celebration in the kingdom for disciplinary reasons. And only the context of each occurrence of that phrase can tell you whether the people in view are one or the other. That is, whether they are believers, which is represented by the, uh, the son in our story, or whether they're unbelievers, which is represented by the, the rebel gang guy in our story, group in our story. I'm just trying to make this point here so that when you read the Bible for yourself, uh, that you don't automatically assume that Jesus is always talking about eternal damnation when we hear the phrase out of darkness or weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, So that's, that's kind of what I want to leave with you. And hopefully it will come up again in, in other messages and it will make some sense. All right, so here we have the people shut out of the kingdom of God entirely, right? That's, these are the ones. And as I said before, their being offended is not completed just yet. Verse 29. And people will come from east and west and north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. So if they're coming from all those different directions, that implies people from all over the world, right? In other words, Gentiles. So Jesus is saying, many of you Jews won't make it, but some Gentiles will. They'll be dining with Abraham, not you. Now, if you're a good Jew, how would you think that would go down? <laughs> Pretty lead balloon, yeah? Um, certainly would have um, got at the noses, especially any Pharisees who might have been listening. Uh, surely we're the most important, Jesus. Yeah, okay, we'll give Abraham, Isaac and Jacob a good spot. Okay, but after them must be us. But no, verse 30. Behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. Now, for those who were at church camp a couple of years ago, I did a demonstration, and rather than do it again, I'll just quickly explain it. So we got people up one at a time, did like a little Bible quiz thing, and handed you a random number from one to five. So I had people stand up and said, okay, just line up in order from one to five. 
Um, so I'll bring that up just like that. So and then I asked, I said, okay, so who wins? And that's a bit of a hard question to answer, isn't it? Because I haven't given any instruction. Now, let's, let's assume it's not two, three and four, right? So we'll say it's either one or five. Who wins? Well, it, sorry? All of them? Well, you know, they won in different ways because they, they've got the thing right. But could, that's right. So we don't know what the paradigm we're using to, use, to, to judge with is. So if you take the Pharisees, they would probably have said, okay, five is the bigger number, that's more points, that's probably the winner. So the Pharisees have gone about saying, all right, so what you've got to do is get number five, so you've got to get the most points, and then you'll be one of the winners, okay? And then they, that's what they taught everyone. The problem is, that wasn't right. Uh, so that's so it was by works. The fact is that God's method of ranking is the opposite to that, he actually wants it by faith. So at the other end. So they thought they had it right, but until you actually understand what God wants, you might be completely wrong. Okay, so that's how we've got to change our thinking. We've got to go by God's way of thinking, not just assume that we've got it right by the most points. Okay, let's start by wrapping up this morning by clarifying the elements now as we try and bring all this together now. In our illustration, I thought it might be helpful to point out what everything is so we can understand it. So the illustration of the, the Christian family, Happy Smiley. He looks pretty uh, Scottish, doesn't he, or something? I don't know, he's very red beard and ginger, yeah. Didn't know God was like that. Um, okay, so yeah, who is the dad? So dad obviously represents God the Father. So he's in charge of the house. He's responsible for the discipline. I mean, mum is too, of course, but um, he's ultimately responsible and about who's in and who's out and all that. So if that's the case, then that would make Jesus would be like the older brother. So that's what's, he's the older brother there in the story, that guy. Um, he's the obedient older brother. But he didn't really come up in the story and neither did mum, so sorry about that, but that's just for this story. So I'm just pointing them out. Um, now the naughty son he's the misbehaving believer I hope that's readable up there now he's in the family by spiritual birth in Christ through faith that's how we all get into the family but he's been sucked in by the world and he needs a wrap on the knuckles now and then so this is all to teach him how to behave in the context of the family of God so he's the one who weeps and gnashes his teeth when he finds he's shut out of the feast but only temporarily, in the, in the darkness of his room outside the bright lit dining room. But not, and not forever, he'll be accepted back for the big finale, Christmas, right? And that will be with the rest of his brothers and sisters. And I looked at that, I realised there's no brothers in those four, they're all sisters, but that's alright. You know, it's the rest of the family, of his siblings. And they obviously represent the spiritual brothers and sisters that we all have in Christ. And there's then the group of uh, no good gang guys who are the unbelievers, so we'll bring them up there. Kind of a cartoony kind of bunch. Now they don't know God, they're not part of his family and they have no place on, at the table in the kingdom of God. So their place is with the evildoers for eternity. And their regret and pain at not accepting Christ when they had the chance means their weeping and gnashing of teeth will be a uh, occurrence going on forever and ever outside the kingdom in hell and ultimately the lake of fire suffering along with the devil and his angels because don't think the devil's down there running hell he's, he's down there with the rest of them and as for the events that we talked about so we had thanks, the Thanksgiving feast that would be like the marriage feast of the Lamb as uh, mentioned in Revelation 19 verse 9 which would make Christmas either the millennial reign of Christ or the eternal state after that um, but that's all beyond the scope of what we're looking at today. So, All right, so what's the point for all this for us here in Collie in 2018? Well, there are points to note for believers and unbelievers here because I mean, Jesus is talking to unbelievers, but there's always something for us. Even though Jesus' main audience in this passage is unbelievers, like I said, the principle is the same for us all. Let's make sure we're dil dil diligently striving to ensure 
we are making our Christianity about simple faith. Okay, as far as being justified goes, and for the believer also, it's our spiritual growth, isn't it? It's, it's, because it's only justification by faith in Jesus that allows us access into the kingdom in the first place. Nothing, nothing else will do it. And it's only by living by faith when we are in there that and that's the Holy Spirit's sanctification in us, which makes us more like Jesus in character as, it do, as he does his work in us. So it's by faith to get in, and it's by faith when we are in. Don't make it about works even good or spiritual works. It doesn't mean don't do them, it just means don't, that's not how we earn credit. It's not, it's not, there's no such thing like that. So let's give you two main ways that this passage shows us that how people can mess this up, this works thing, all right? There's two things out of this passage. And I, we see people getting this wrong all the time. So it's like the Jews Jesus was speaking to, whose belief in their own good works was actually keeping them from God because they thought they were doing it themselves. That actually separates you from God. And so for us today, we can see that that attitude in the thinking that we can impress God by our works enough to have him accept us. So that's that's not the right thing. So why is that wrong? Because the basis of our acceptance is Jesus and his blood given for us as an unblemished sacrifice. He's the one who lived that perfect life that we can't do. So that's taken away the sin barrier for us all, meaning it's all about faith in that already completed work, the work of Jesus, not us. So that's the first pitfall that many fall into. Now the other is seen in the way that people... Jesus was speaking to claimed that they, since they'd hung out with Jesus, they were okay. Remember that statement? They said, you know, we, you were with us and we we're hanging around with us, so we must be all right. So in the same way, many in churches today believe they're saved just because they're born into a Christian family or because they hang around with church people. You know, that means I'm all right. No, each person is responsible for their own response to Jesus. You can't be born into it. You can't get it by osmosis just by being involved, even heavily involved in church. There's some who who, um, can just seem like Christians, but they're actually not. It's it's like you can't, standing in a garden bed doesn't make you a flower, okay? You just, you need to personally accept Christ and be justified before God. Remember what Jesus said, no man, singular, comes to the Father except through me. You don't get a group deal package thing. It's your own choice. He's the one gate. You can only fit one person at a time. If you want to yeah, take it figuratively like that. He's the one gate. He's the one door. And it's a narrow door. Only a few find it. So I guess the question again is, are you in or are you out? So in conclusion, unbelievers, are you trying to get in by doing good, good works, good things? or just by hanging out with God's people. That gets you shut out of the kingdom. Believers, do you think you can live a life like the world and not have some consequences? We're thinking of being at the, at the, the dinner there. God will not be mocked. If you are truly his child, you can expect to be disciplined and perhaps forfeit some of your inheritance and miss out on the coming feast if you are being uh, naughty, I suppose you can say. So no matter where you are spiritually today, those are some things to consider. So we all need to get fed income, turn our faces toward Jesus and come in through the narrow door because he's our only hope. So let's pray. Lord, before, as Paul writes, we had no hope, but because of you we do now have hope. And we thank you for being that one door for us. Help us all to come through you, Lord, because there is no other way. And and our lives as Christians, Lord, we know we do fail. And it's not about doing all the right things. It's just it's about entrusting ourselves more and more deeply to you, Lord, in in full heart and in uh, complete abandonment to you. In, in uh, and Lord, we pray for the strength to do that. We cannot do it ourselves, Lord. Please take us and mould us into your image. 
and uh, we look forward to the day when we will be with you in person. So we thank you for that message to us in Jesus' name. Amen.